Now I'd like to start the afternoon by introducing our keynote speaker, ALTA President Dan Wold. Dan Wold is the Executive Vice President of Industry Relations and Strategic Initiatives and Corporate Secretary for Old Republic National Title Insurance Company. He is a member of the company's executive leadership team. And in his current role, he monitors and advises on national developments affecting the title insurance industry. He also assists with strategic initiatives. They've got to quit putting those words in there. That's too hard. Initiatives relating to developments impacting Old Republic due to changes and challenges confronting the industry. Prior to 2020, he was Old Republic's general counsel and managed the underwriting, regulatory, and transactional group of the company's corporate legal department. Dan is active in the American Land Title Association, currently serves as its president, and he has served on the Alta's Board of Governors since 2015 and served on various other Alta committees, either as a participant or as a chair since 2009. It is my honor to introduce to you Alta President Dan Wold. Well, thank you, Mitzi. And have you seen the movie Fargo? All right, I'm from Minnesota, and uh, don't you know, we do talk like that. Uh, and I tried to fly somebody in to interpret between Minnesota home but they the, the flight was canceled so you're stuck with me all right <laughs> anyway so um, every year it's one of the one of the benefits of being on the Board of Governors is to go out to the state uh, land title association conventions and and talk about all the important developments and at a national and, and local level that are that are happening and so it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, in the great state of Oklahoma and uh, you know if you uh, if you hear me misspeak some of the English words that would normally be spoken a different way here, just try to give me a, give me a little slack, you know, what the heck. Anyway, so w every year we have a, a, basically I'm going to give you kind of the story, the backstory of what is about. And uh, every year we have a, a slide about all the strategic priorities. And so let's talk just generally about the backstory involving how we come up with strategic priorities and uh, and then we'll go through some of the details here but you know alta obviously is the national trade association for our industry and if the governance structures there's a board of governors and there's 11 members and they're uh, split between uh, the underwriters and agents and i know you're doing the math and you're going well oh, how do you divide into 11 that's complicated, but actually that's the, the pro immediate past president isn't really counted in the count, so they could be from the agent or underwriter side. But anyway, what we try to accomplish at the, at the uh, Board of Governors is we try to get diversity within that, that construct. So we will get um, small agents from different parts, big agents, medium-sized agents from different parts of the country and, and then some of the representation on the underwriter side then has also tried to balance everything out. And the reason for that is really strategic and, and it's about bringing diverse voices together so that collectively we have a better chance of being aware of the challenges facing the industry and then coming up with solutions so that we can keep the industry strong and move forward. So one of the things I think that I like about that is what, what we do is we lay the foundation. We lay a foundation so that the structure is there so that we can, as long as we execute and engage, we are able to, you know, weather the storms that have approached our industry and we've had a couple good years and but there have been years in the past where there are a lot of challenges and i think i was just at the oklahoma TIPAC meeting uh you know i can't uh, reinforce enough the need to be planning for the bad years when we're when, when we're in the good years and uh, it's like uh 
I know somebody else has said this, but it, the time to talk about Noah, about building an ark, is not when it's pouring, okay? Um, and so, uh, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, we just have to be vigilant. So the board every year gets together under this structure in July at a planning meeting, and basically we ask ourselves three essential questions. You know, what is the state of the industry? What will the industry look like in five years? And what are the big factors that will impact the need for our services and products. And those different concerns and perspectives are, are shared and from the multiple viewpoints that hopefully reflect a diverse diversity throughout the country. Uh, basically, we then distill all of the kind of the uh, concerns and, and challenges that we per perceive collectively down to a consensus. And uh, then that becomes that year's strategic priorities. Uh, one of the things that was interesting for me in relation to this exercise, and I've been doing it for a while now, is you think about one of the questions is, who are our disruptors? And one of the interesting attributes of that, it also ties into unintended consequences as well, or secondary consequences. So like the Uber example. Well, obviously, if you owned a New York ca taxi cab, those things were worth, what? The medallion was worth a half a million dollars before Uber. I don't know what it's worth now. Um, and so that was an obvious disruption to that industry because it provided a technology-based uh, portal that then connected consumers to transportation in a much more effective manner than hailing a taxi cab. But I don't know how many of you have thought about this, but a secondary impact of that is the rental car industry. I mean, when I was traveling before, I'd oftentimes get a rental car, and in a lot of cities, I would rather not have to drive, park, and the like, and get a rental car unless there's a specific reason for it, and so you just do use Uber or Lyft or their alternatives. And so that's kind of the secondary consequence. So when you're, when you're sitting and looking at who are our disruptors, who's coming at us, now we, we sat through the presentation earlier today where we we're looking at all the prop tech and fintech challenges to our industry and i i'm looking at you guys look marvelous and trendy but the the these guys are out there thinking we're all a bunch of luddites that that we we don't have a clue and that our industry is ready for disruption and so they're out there and money's getting poured into the vc money's coming in and they're coming at us and so we need to collectively think about what of those challenges or which of those challenges are the most significant. And then if we're smart, we take the idea of disruption and sometimes we can adopt it into our practices through technological advances and the like and basically stay ahead of them. So um, I kind of like to refer to that process as an elegant design and, and it provides the, the structure for us to collectively make sure that we are going to stay strong today and into the future. And as long as we do that and then we're engaged and execute, I'm really confident about the prospects for our industry. Uh, you know, so one of my themes this year as president is engagement. And just being here means you're engaged. And what I'd like to see is broad-based engagement. Uh, uh, throughout the industry, when people understand the value that your industry provides and are engaged with that, they're much better able to be advocates for our industry. You know, I like to think about uh, when we were one of the first uh, priorities, which we'll, we'll pull up now, um, was tell our story. You know, we're all telling our story, but for a while there, people will come up and say, what, what do you do? And you, know, you start talking about, you know, I've done a lot of different things in uh, my Alta journey. And we can't, when we had to deal with HUD with, uh, with RESPA reform, and that's before TRID, we came up with a document, and I think it was the 136 things that we do between order entry and closing. And so for a while there, <laughs> You start rattling these off and the, the eyes glaze over, right? So it's not, it is not effective. And so uh, as part of this process about, you know, having some professional coaching about how we should refine telling our story, 
uh, they gave the uh, kind of the idea of, okay, you're, you're ordering a cocktail at a bar, and somebody says, oh, so what do you do? Or you're riding in an elevator, and you've got two floors. And so, you know, so at that point, well, we provide peace of mind, and we pr protect property rights. Well, that might spur a conversation. You can get a little deeper. But by doing that and knowing how to message, it's much more effective. And, uh, you know, I was in denial for a while. Well, what about the 136 things? You know, we got to talk about those. But they're, they were looking at me like, no, you don't. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then engagement also starts at the state level. And I can't stress the importance of state land title associations for the industry at large. Because the engagement at the local level then works up to the national level and we're all stronger for it. You might have specific local issues like we just heard about, uh, was it 1609? Yeah, I mean, what? How, I, I was incensed when I heard about that bill. Uh, but nonetheless, you've got to be uh, ready and able to do it. But if there's something like that that was on a national basis, we would then have your engagement coming up to the national level, uh, informing us, and then we'd be able to uh, basically extrapolate that and come up with solutions, hopefully, for addressing those challenges. So I will echo one other thing. Engagement also in includes having a strong local PAC as well as a strong Thai pack, and if you're not a member of TAN, by a show of hands, are, are, is everybody here a member of TAN? It's, it's real easy to do, and you can go onto the Alta website, and you can text something. I forget, I don't have it on the slide, but you can become a member. But so if not everybody's a member, I can't really tell you you've got to contribute to Thai pack, but I can talk about the value of Thai pack. And uh, Thai pack, just like your local pack, it's the same kind of deal. If you haven't noticed at the national level, there's a lot of people that are retiring. They've had it. And, uh, and so we've got a lot of friends who've been great for the industry at the national level who are, are hanging up their, uh, uh, taking off their uh, cleats or whatever you want to use for a metaphor here and going home. Uh, and we've got new people coming in that we have to make friends with and find out who's a supporter of our industry. And that takes some capital. And we're much more effective when we can have a, a, a reason to uh, meet with them, hand them a check and the like, and uh, find out how much, and tell them our story about how effective and, and important our industry is for the national economy, but for consumers as well. So obviously, I think Type X really important, and I'm pleased to announce we're ahead of schedule. But I'd also like to see uh, the, the number of people who contribute to, to be much more expansive. And I don't know what it's like at the, at the state level, but I'd, why not give 10 bucks? You know, uh, if we've got a lot of people giving 10 bucks, great. You know, we need the big donors, but we also need more 10, 20, $50 donors at the national level as well. So if, if, if you go back to your place of work and you wanna do some good work, you might just say, hey, how about throwing 10 bucks at it, two cups of coffee a year, or something like that. All right, so let's move on now, and we're gonna talk about these six strategic priorities. Uh, the first one is tell our story. And this has been around, this is year three, uh, and it's perhaps our most important priority. Now, that's not to diminish all the other stuff that we do. I mean, we've been firing at, and it'll show up later, uh, wire transfer fraud for quite some time, and we've got really great collateral site that can assist you because frankly you who has an extra two hundred thousand dollars in their checking account uh, <laughs> oh I don't uh, in the event a bad thing happens and so we'll talk about that in a minute but telling our story and you can be the judge of which is most important but it's important for us to tell our story well and what has impressed me about the campaign is the professionalism with which we are approaching this. So we are measuring the messages that we get and the reaction that we receive to determine what is the most effective messaging that we can do. And that messaging 
changes from audience to audience. And, but the measuring is, so for example, uh, well, in a, and in a side of part of this is that we need to tell our story. Uh, when we were doing some, uh, when we had some, uh, the, the, the outside consultants were, were finding out about what did people know about title insurance. They uh, interviewed a few real realtors and it, it just still cracks me up to, one guy uh, said, yeah, he understood our product really well and the, and the monthly copay is not too, too high. <laughs> You know, and just went on with other stuff. He just, they don't really understand our story. We need to tell our story. And so we've got some great tools for that. Um, so we communicate also about, by telling our story, it also ties into, uh, uh, if you look at number two, talent. If we tell our story effectively, we are better able to attract and retain talent. Uh, you know, so there, the, these kind of, all weave together and make it all stronger. Uh, but you know, when we communicate about the opportunities the industry provides, and uh, it, it, it basically allows us to attract and retain talent, as I mentioned, and that's really important, and that might be, in a lot of people's mind, the number one issue that they're facing at this point in time. And so I'll give you a few facts and data about it, but this campaign, it util utilizes new tools, data, and research to help the industry find the most effective messaging for the different target audiences. And the goal is to communicate the value of title insurance and to ins explain the importance and relevance of our advocacy, all designed to make us stronger. Now, um, the reason I think it's also important for us to tell our story, because who better to tell our story? So on that also, I'll mention serving our communities with purpose. We've got a charitable foundation, which then has allowed us to, to make charitable contributions to real estate and uh, tied charities at the local level, uh, which then can, it, it highlights who we are as people giving back to communities and where we are within the community. So anyway, that's where we're at, but I think this campaign is wonderful. It pay, plays off the word title. So uh, the initial phrase is, our title is protection. And I, I think that's catchy, you know, and someone got big bucks for that, I'll tell you what. Uh, and so we're... So that's our tell our story slide. I think we've got another one here. So t uh, our title is protection, uh, and, and, we're, and we're also then coming up with ways to demonstrate the value of the people in the industry to our communities and our customers. Uh, we are in the community, and so I think the next slide, I was much younger then. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we, I think we've got one more slide, but I'm going to talk about some of the polling that they did. They polled some policymakers at the DC level to find out what their uh, thoughts were about different players within the greater real estate finance marketplace. And, oh goodness, how did that happen? All right, you see the gray down there in the bottom? Unlike realtors and lenders, there's a lot of people that really don't have a strong opinion about us. And that's actually, positive because what that demonstrates is that if we tell a great story and message properly we can move them into the blue or dark blue column much more effectively than if you if you uh, see some of the other slides for the other uh, realtors and others they have stronger support and stronger uh, de uh, deterrence as well uh, so so if you've got you know 20 percent of dark red that's that's people that are going to be really hard to sway to the positive side. And so the gray is good because it demonstrates that with proper messaging, we can influence more so than most of the industries in the broader real estate space. Now these are uh, a few of the display ads that we had. Um, you know, about, I'm in the title ins insurance industry, but like, I'm a soccer mom, you know, or I'm, you know, I'm in the community. And I think they were very effective and, 
And if you're an Alta member, you can go on and you can pull all this collateral uh, if you want to do something at the local level and, and uh, it's, it's, it's there for you to use. So, any questions about telling our story? All right, I think you guys tell it well here too. Now we're going to move on to uh, just a, a couple last thoughts about it as to where we're going to go. Now this going forward is also going to focus at the local level. So we're going to provide tools for you to get more active on telling at the local level the value that title insurance has and, and your connection to your communities. Um, I'm also going to make a note that we're getting pretty techy savvy because my notes reflect that we are also refining Google search campaign uh, to basically find out the keywords that then direct you to Alta's website, Home Closing 101, for more information. So if someone's searching for a home and they enter in certain things, they will have the opportunity to basically get more information about our industry and what we do and in the, in the value of our products by basically doing a click-through. And the, the click-through rate is apparently above 5%, which I'm told is pretty high. So we will continue to do the message testing going forward. We're going to do it more local. And from that standpoint, I do think this campaign is going to be around for a while. We've got a group called Marathon, which is our outside consultant, and they're doing a great job for us. Uh, and I do look forward to uh, uh, us continuing to be in the, in the leader, leadership role of telling our story in a way that really influences the basically perceptions that people have of our industry at a wide range of things, everything from consumer to legislatures to regulators and policymakers. Now, serving our communities with purpose is the second uh, strategic priorities. And essentially, we advocate for policies that expand home ownership. And there's a big push at this point in time in the Biden administration on affordability. Uh, and you're going you're gonna to see quite a bit of coverage at the, at the, at the press level on that topic. Um, but what we're trying to do is communicate well and, and have discussions so that we are part of the discussion about solutions to problems that are perceived at the national level. Um, we also, I don't know if you've seen this at the local level, but uh, there have been concerns about um, uh, uh, restrictive covenants and so forth with language that some people are, are, are challenged by, even though there's a US Supreme Court decision which says they're not viable or, or enforceable. And so there's some dialogue going on in, in multiple jurisdictions as to what we're going to do about that. And so we're trying to demonstrate that we're a great industry and that we are looking forward to coming up with solutions to problems that are perceived. My own view um, on that one is it's not enforceable. Okay, but, but there's a perception that if it's out there that that detracts negatively on our industry. So we're on board with the process of coming up with solutions to change that perception. Now, I'm gonna talk about the Good Deeds Foundation real quick. And you might be uh, the lucky person who pushes this over a million bucks. It's exceeded uh, expectations. Um, and it was started during the pandemic. And um, there, it started as a blog. And it was the concept, we do good deeds. And so then you could go on the blog and you could identify the good deeds you're doing at the local level. And then all of a sudden we said, well, how about let's, let's do a charitable, uh, let's start a charitable organization and take it up a notch. And right now we're approaching $900,000 of donations so far. Uh, we expect at some point this year we'll get over a million and that's a pretty big number for something that's barely two years old. And we've got board members that are on the board of this and they, they really seem to be uh, um, amazed at the reaction, the positive reaction you get at the local level. The structure of this is basically we give like five or $6,000 to a smaller local-based 
a charitable foundation that's got ties to real estate or, or a broader cause. And th some of the testimonials from people that are, are smaller, that $5,000 can be an earth mover. It can, it can move a lot for them. And what I would say for you is there are submission times during the year. If you know a local charity that you think is doing a great job that could use a boost, there's a submission process and make a pitch for them. Uh, I think the last uh, time period, there were like 75, not everybody, we can't give to everybody, but there were like 75 uh, that uh, were submitted and I believe uh, the last go round uh, about $130,000. So you do the math, that's like, uh, you know, maybe a half or a third might, might uh, get an award. And uh, it's, it's really, uh, a few of them have had great stories to tell us as, as the impact of that gift. But the point of that is this ties back to, and I know that that's good in and of itself. But I also like to think strategically. Um, it's also good for the industry. We're telling our story. We want to present ourselves as giving back to our community. In addition to the valuable work that we do in our primary job functions, we're members of the community, we care about our community, and we give back to our communities. And so I think that's really important. All right, so let's see. Yeah, 130,000. Uh, there were 75 applicants. You know, and so um, the next um, strategic priority, before I get there, you know, that's talent. And I love that term talent because uh, we need to find it and retain it and keep it. And that helps keep our industry strong because there's a good, in the marketplace, if you haven't noticed, there's, there's quite a competition for talent and for workers at this point in time. And what's been interesting about that, that we mo when we moved to it is, um, we would get out among the various locations in the states and ultimately what else is on your mind and everyone is saying we can't find anyone to work in our operations you got to do something so we'll talk about that any in a minute but it's basically also we we tie this into the values campaign we had and if you remember that was we lead we deliver and we protect and uh, so the the uh, Good Deeds Foundation is basically we deliver for our local communities. All right, so again, if you want to give, you can text Good Deeds 44321 today. Or you can go to altagooddeeds.org. So, attract, develop, and retain talent. So, so far, is this the number one concern in Oklahoma? Is it really, really hard to find people? Or, I mean, and it's not a solution just for us to poach each other, okay? Uh, yeah, well, we need, to, we need to develop and get new talent coming in, and then we all benefit. And so I do, I do share your pain, though. I don't know, how many of you ever gone to the third grade, um, here's what my mom or dad does for work uh, day? All right, so just thinking about our tough challenge, you know, let's pretend I get to go present and I'm gonna talk about title insurance and the important things we do at the closing. And I'm fi following the astronaut, the fireman, the policeman, <laughs> and the rodeo bull rider, right? <laughs> You're not gonna get a lot of attention from the little kiddos, you know, on that. But, uh, you know, so, there's a little bit of data I'll talk about here, um, and then, then I don't have any solutions other than to point to there's a lot of collateral to assist you on the Alta website for this concern. But we're in the midst of a national demographic change, which is significant because of the boomers. And uh, how, many, how many boomers out there? Oh, we got a couple, okay. Anyway. Uh, I won't tell how old you are, but anyway, we're in the midst of a national demographic change, and I also need to know how many millennials are in the audience. 
Don't be shy. Put your hand up. Okay. All right. Uh, now, here's here's a moment of pandering by an old old guy. You know, I I've read a lot of books and read articles about how millennials are ruining America. Right. I mean, everything from if they want to play golf, it's only 13 holes, you know, <laughs> and on down all the other stuff that they book. But, you know, the data most re recently demonstrates that millennials are not that much different than other generations preceding them. It's just that they delay everything about three years on average from every other generation, you know, and so you're, you're going to turn out pretty normal. So there's some good arguments you have. <laughs> Was that a rousing support for the millennials? Give me a round of hand. I mean, my goodness, yeah, millennials. All right, well, the reason, reason I, I focus on millennials is because they're 50% of the workforce right now. They're also 50% of the home buyers we are dealing with at this point in time, too. And by 2030, the projection is 75%. So they're going to dominate. They're the next... What, what's the best metaphor? What, what goes through a python? I mean, well, let's just let's say a, a watermelon through a python. So the boomers came through, uh, and now we got the millennials coming through. And one thing that we have a common bond on, and if they're here, I apologize, we all fear reg, uh, Generation Z. I mean, we're worried about them. You know, I mean, my goodness. And I'm also amazed that the next generation, with all the texting going on, I'm thinking at some point, you're going to have hands with a thumb that's like this. <laughs> okay. We, we digress. We digress. All right. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. So when my daughter, and this is a while ago, when she was like uh, eighth, ninth grade, I, we had a sleepover, and I think, I think she over-invited. So I had a navigator with a back seat, and I had eight young, eight, nine-year-old, or ninth-grade girls in there, and I was just uh, gobsmacked, if that's a word, <laughs> by the fact that no one was talking to each other, and the, the people in the front were texting the people in the back, and I'm going, this is just not right. This is not right. All right, so we died. <laughs> All right, anyway, so we got to, but, but ultimately in the day, this is really important for us as an industry. We need to attract that talent to continue to grow. And so we need to articulate the benefits of what our industry provides. And demographically, it's even worse, even though the shift is there, the average age of an employee in the title industry is 46 years old. Do you have any idea what the average age across all industries is? 42. I didn't let you answer. Uh, but so we've got it worse than others. We are eight, we, we're slightly above the curve with a lot of retirements coming on. Now, people can work longer in the title industry than if you're construction, but nonetheless, we've got a challenge here. All right, so this is a graph. I love the colors. Does that jump out at you guys? All right, so the dark blue is the millennials. And uh, that's, that's a big, uh, big watermelon, or whatever you want to call it there. But ultimately, as boomers retire, and before the next generation really gets to be that significant, this generation will dominate. And so a couple of observations, the reason I mentioned our values campaign. What we're finding is that this generation is, is different or at least they claim to be different than the boomers. You know, the uh, kind of the knock on the boomers is that we were materialistic. We want to things, you know. And supposedly millennials are not into things, they're into experiences. Okay, so uh, we want to give them a great experience when they're working for our industry. And that experience is also tied on they want to be connected and feel good and have an alignment about doing good for the world through their work as well as through their personal lives. And so to the extent that we as an industry can highlight the things that will attract that millennial talent, uh, we are better able to attract and retain that uh, core group of workers. And also as a company, don't take them for granted once they're on board. Uh, you've got to make sure they understand that they're appreciated and that they're 
that oftentimes have career paths and things like that. So they're looking for a lot. So just because you hire them doesn't mean that the work is done. You've got to keep at it. So um, a couple of other things to point out here. We have a good, a, a, you know, our industry actually pays well. The average wage across board is seventy-five thousand dollars, and if you. And one thing that you can articulate is that not all jobs in the title industry require a college education. So you can have a middle class uh, lifestyle even with a high school education. And I think that that's something that people should really get out there and promote. That we have great job opportunities and growth opportunities and we're a great industry. And that's where this telling our story and basically the uh, giving back to communities and all of that plays into our hands for basically bringing in the talent, making them feel that they are making the right choice as to the work experience that they're doing and they're gonna stick around and then that talent will keep making us strong as we go forward. All right, so if you're a smaller operation or not, even if you're a bigger operation, alta.org uh, backslash human resources is an amazing repository of collateral for you to deal with the issues about retaining and, and acquiring talent. I've got a couple notes here about some of the stuff that they have on it, and it's really impressive in my mind. Uh, you know, they've got an uh, HR, Human Resources Sample Library with all kinds of online resources, including job descriptions and ads, interview questions, employee engagement surveys, etc. And the Alta Talent Committee has developed a sample diversity, equity, and inclusion statement to the extent that you're in a marketplace where that's really important to attract and retain as well. And so we have a lot of great things there, including videos. Everybody loves videos. So, Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a great resource out there. This is kind of like having your own HR department if you're a smaller enterprise. And I recommend that you, you go to that website. And you may not learn, you may already be doing all of the things on there and you may know everything. But what I found, you know, uh, in my attorney role, you'd have to do CLEs. And for a while there, I was feeling like, what a waste of time. I didn't learn anything. And then I changed my attitude. Not that I'm, this may sound wrong. I, I, I mean, I'm a humble Norwegian guy, right? Uh, but then you go there and you go, I already know this, right? And so you learn something even if you don't learn something. That you're on top of it, that you've already got this, and so there's some benefit to it. So I'd recommend that you check that out. All right, so let's move on to the next strategic priority. But before we get much farther, I don't know about you, but I'm getting awfully hyperventilated. This material is so exciting to me. <laughs> uh, so at the risk of offending anyone, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, and we're going to start gently. And we might be, be tip picking on a neighboring state. And it's not the one you think I'm gonna tell. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Bilbrey was over there going, oh no, oh no. Uh, but it's, a, it's about Oli, and he's a, he's a farmer up there in North Dakota near Fargo, you know. And don't, don't you know? And he's got a nice spread, you know, about 480 acres, you know, and that's that, that, that thick, dark soil up there, and it's really fertile. And he was in this kind of exchange and, he, and a Texas rancher came up, and he shows up, and he walks out of his truck. He's got the big boots on, a cowboy hat on, and he, you know, he was talking about what a great place he has, and he's looking around, puffing his chest out, and says, you know, my ranch is so big, it takes me two days to drive across it in my pickup truck. And all he starts laughing and goes, <laughs> I had a truck like that once. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to the exciting slide deck. So, addressing threats to our customers' privacy and investment. Now, we have been firing at 
wire transfer fraud for multiple years. And it's a worthy effort. Um, I mean, because like I said, you don't have an extra $200,000 in your checking account just to give away to some, uh, somebody from Eastern Europe or I guess we don't want to pick on Eastern Europe right now, uh, some Russian, okay? Um, you know, uh, you just, so we've got some great stuff and great collateral in that, and we're also going to talk about privacy in general. And if, if you, uh, I should put a picture of the state of California to get a couple groans up here, but uh, if you're talking privacy for a second, California did the CCPA, that's too many letters, right? Uh, you know, but anyway, uh, adopting a privacy regime, which then, in the, in the want of the great state of California, they say it applies outside the state's border. So it's extra jurisdictional, and that's always a challenge, you know. But ultimately, at the end of the day, so that creates a challenge for regional and national companies, and also could affect, in fact, impact even smaller entities in Oklahoma that might be doing a transaction with a transplant from California. There might be some people doing cash deals and moving to the great state of Oklahoma from California and you don't realize you might have some impact and, and the like. But ultimately at the end of the day, uh, we're gonna talk about privacy first. And uh, ultimately I expect Privacy legislation will be adopted in all 50 states, or maybe 48, right? There might be a couple outliers, uh, over the next five to 10 years. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we're going to end up with a hodgepodge of uh, privacy legislation throughout the country. And then that will probably force the federal government to come in and do a, an overriding piece of legislation that then preempts conflicting provisions and state laws. But at the end of the day, you're going to see this as an issue. And I don't know, is there any discussion at your state legislature about adopting privacy legislation at this point in time? Yeah, and so, you know, whether it passes this year, it might not. Maybe it takes a couple of years to pass, but ultimately you're going to have to deal with this. And frankly, protecting our consumers' data is important. That's part of who we should be, being good stewards to our customers and employees and others. Uh, but you're going to see it come across the country, and you're going to see it in Oklahoma. Now, this slide talks real quickly about redaction. And I don't know if there's any uh, legislation for redaction in Oklahoma, but I'll just... I, the reason I'll talk about this slide is more so to talk about kind of the role of Alta as there are emerging concepts, trends, and so forth throughout the country. Uh, so in this situation, you had a federal judge, I believe it was in New Jersey, who um, somebody who uh, uh, she had uh, convicted or otherwise came and tried to do violence and actually shot and killed her son. And as a result, at the federal level, they have passed legislation to protect these people. Uh, you know, not just, not just judges, but policemen, public servants around the country. Florida has dealt with this. Multiple states are already doing this. And so one of the ways that they think they solve this problem is just wiping all of those people that fall in the class they want to protect, their data is off the public records. Well, that creates a challenge for our industry. And not just for the current status, but then how do you restore that data? How do you, you're going to get gaps in the public records, which makes it really tough. So ultimately, at the end of the day, what we've done, we've got uh, lots of different committees and the like. They came up with some best practices as to how do we deal with this. We don't want to get in front of the public policy decision to protect people because that's, a, that's not a, a winning argument. But instead, we basically say, you've got to come up with a process so that we can still be effective, the public records are protected, and allow us to do our job. And so um, there's a set of principles here uh, that I will just note real quickly. 
Bear with me. Oh, yes, here we go. So basically, we, you know, they've come up with a set of principles. And if you are encountering this, you can go to the Alta resource and see the best practices as to what legislation could or should look like for us you know, within the confines of what's permissible, what you can accomplish, so that we can continue to do our job and be not as negatively impacted. But you permission to access. So for example, we should, as in our industry, we should have some mechanism to get access to those public records that are blocked. And then uh, at some point, the shielding request should be time limited, and there should be a practice or some process for the record restoration. So anyway, that's an example of some of the great things you can turn to through Alta in the event you see some legislation in Oklahoma that's challenging. Because we probably have seen it elsewhere uh, and have thought about it and got great committees and great people serving on community committees and we'll have a best practices or model legislation that you could then look at and, and then work with to, uh, to craft what happens at your state level. And if you're the first, then we want to know about it. So it's a two-way street. All right, you've heard enough of me for a minute. We're gonna take a break from me and we've got a video. As homeowners, we'll do whatever it takes to protect our homes. But did you know that there are burglars who can rob your home even before it's yours? It's called real estate wire transfer fraud, but homeowners may call it something else. Wire transfer fraud is the biggest single detriment going on right now in real estate transactions. Take your life savings that you have worked so hard for and pff, it's just gone. How do these cyber criminals get away with it? They start by hacking into unsecure email servers and searching for upcoming real estate closings. They pose as legit financial institutions and email unsuspecting home buyers. Then the crooks send out bogus wire transfer instructions and wait for the money to be wired. So who's protecting homeowners from wire transfer fraud? Real estate title professionals are on the offense. We mitigate wire transfer fraud, actually reaching out to our clients on day one. We educate buyers and sellers throughout the entire process and talk about how to protect themselves. On what to look for. Getting the word out, it's informing your clients, it's informing the consumers, um, it's constantly retraining your employees. It's keeping it top of mind all the time. Using advanced technology ensures that they are sending or we are receiving the wire from the right source. We're doing our best to make sure wire transfer fraud doesn't happen to you. So you can feel protected on the biggest financial purchase of your life. The American Land Title Association. Our title is protection. So that's an example of uh, I think a very effective short um, uh, video that you can pull on YouTube and others because a lot of people are looking at this and there's a lot of collateral that Alta has for these type of issues. But not to belabor um, this topic much more because we've talked about this for multiple years, but I want to just highlight a couple things. Number one, there's a, just a great pile of great collateral for you in the Alta website on this issue. There's checklists and, the th and, and uh, like. And if there's one takeaway from today is look at this. If you haven't already fired at this issue, you don't have to remember any jokes I told. You don't have to remember else about this strange Minnesotan that came down to Oklahoma. You go home, back to your office, check this out. If you haven't done so already, the data shows that the more training you do, the less likely you are to have an incident. And if you train and follow the checklist, even if something bad happens, you are much more likely to basically be able to avoid a loss. And remember, time is of the essence. You got like 24 to 48 hours before you can pull these things back. And if you don't act immediately, and so if nothing else, well, here's the, here's the challenge you're gonna have. An employee does something and they know it was bad, but they're, they fear telling you about it. And then they wait for a week and then all of a sudden you go, 
hey, we're done. That's it. We lost $300,000. I don't have it. We're closing up shop. Instead, let them be trained to know, hey, if anything happens, you've got to come to us immediately. No questions asked. Just come. We'll, we'll deal with it. Uh, you know, stuff happens. You know, the S, S word. Um, and, uh, but anyway, a couple takeaways on that topic. So we're going to move through the rest of it fairly quickly. There's two more strategic priorities, which won't take much time. Uh, you, you sat through the presentation earlier today talking about digital. And there's a couple things here. Uh, basically, Ron, you've already adopted. Secure notarization is already out there on the national level. I think at some point it will get passed, as you saw the list of states that are resisting. So we're going to have, this will be part of the toolkit for the digital future. Now, the other thing that I think is important to remember is that I think our industry is ready, by and large, or we can be ready fairly quickly once we realize that we need to be ready in a smaller shop that so far hasn't allocated the resources to do this. A couple of things to follow up on what was said earlier. The MBA and Alta have a collaboration. It's a MISMO, this is a, this is a mouthful, the E-Eligibility Exchange, like it's three small E's. And what this does is basically identifies a transaction as to how much digital it can be. You know, in some, some county recorders, it, it won't happen. But ultimately, at the end of the day, by coming up with the, the proper coding and the like, they can, at the forefront of the transaction, know whether this is going to be a hybrid or it can be fully digital. The, the reason I bring this to your attention, MBA is going to promote this finally. The bankers have been holding back because they're not ready for it, no matter what they say. Once they are ready and push it, we could go from 5 or 7% to 50% fairly quickly. So just keep that in mind if you haven't uh, allocated uh, the necessary resources to be ready for this. Just be aware that this could move quickly. And so at some point, in order for you to be successful, you're going to need to allocate those resources on a fairly quick basis. And so uh, I would just commend you to look at this issue a little bit and consider, notwithstanding the fact that we've been telling you for 10 years digital is here tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a pretty hard message to, to, to do, but yeah, believe us this time. Uh, so a couple pieces of data on digital. Um, through the pandemic, the, the percentage, the number of title and settlement companies offering di digital closing increased 228%. Now, albeit that was a low number to start with, right? So it's a big number, but it's, it's moving up. And the survey of 300 title professionals that Alta did, uh, it, the number is up 40%, uh, excuse me, I restate, restate that. 46% are now offering digital closing, and that's up from 14%. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a little bit of uh, positives on the feedback from Ron. Uh, it went a little smoother and the like. And so there's some positives on that, and it will come at you. Now, I'm going to talk about a couple things real quickly, and then we're going to wrap up. We're going to just move past that. <laughs> it, the future has arrived. All right. Um, that actually was a, a quote from Seabiscuit, Jeff Bridges. And I always wondered, I'm surprised it's still in here. We had a picture of him in there, but then we couldn't do the video because of copyright. And I'm just going, OK, that's, maybe we should come up with a better way to do it. But I don't mean to be critical. Uh, anyway, Alter Registry, uh, it's important. Another thing you should look at, it started out as a utility phone book, and it's growing. And we're going to get more and more lender adoption, so you should be on it. It also includes uh, additional uh, information on there that's going to make it more relevant. Ron Reddy is on there. E&O information, so for an agent uh, interacting on multiple underwriters, and I won't make a pitch because I'm Switzerland in my role, but you know who I work for. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, all kidding aside, it helps. If you've got multiple underwriters, it, it makes it easier for you if you've got, they can pull it off of that one spot. So that will save you a lot of time. All right, so... 
collaboration, we try to collaborate. And there's uh, affordability challenges being raised at the GSE levels right now, and that's just recent, which we as an industry will dialogue with and explain the value of title insurance and try to move that in a positive direction. Uh, but one of the things that we need to do, and this is important, is we need to continue to talk to all of the other players in the broader real estate marketplace so that when challenges come up for us or for all of us, we are much stronger and better able to move forward. One quick pitch, Did it, do you all know that we've got new forms? All right, so contact your underwriter. You can get into the details of the coverages, what's the difference, and so forth. We didn't want to do a deep dive. That could be a 40-minute presentation and you'd all need pillows. No offense, John. <laughs> Again, get involved with advocacy. Again, come to Washington, D.C. in May for the advocacy event. And here's a slide about the outsized importance of Oklahoma. You already knew it. But you guys have some really powerful players at the legislative branch at D.C. that uh, can make a difference for us as an industry. And so to the extent that you have relationships with those individuals, let us know. Uh, because you might have a daughter that plays soccer with one of their daughters or something like that. You know, and that, that, that is influential. Some more uh, important data on Oklahoma. And some upcoming events. Advocacy. DC May 16th to 18th and it's going to be a bit of a hybrid but we're going to bring them to us it's going to it's a little more of a challenge because of uh, they're still working through security issues at the Capitol for us to do what how many of you have done an advocacy day before uh, wouldn't you agree with me that it, that's really it's really rewarding and if when once we get back to normal if you haven't done it I'd recommend you do it it's really a great day you, you need to bring uh, the right pair of shoes, though, to avoid, to avoid buying moleskin at the local Walgreen by Capitol Hill. Um, all right, and then also Alta One is this year, it's Hotel Del, Del Coronado in uh, basically just near San Diego, and that's October. And any questions? Now, I'm going to be bold, and John, I apologize for this. But I wanted to ask everybody here, as I wrap up, if they know the difference between cowboy boots and Texas boots. Anyone? Cowboy boots have the shit on the outside. <laughs> yeah. Now, right now, I am I'm higher than high in Oklahoma, but remember, I speak, I speak in Texas in June, and guess what I'm going to tell them. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. You're a great audience, and keep doing what you do. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dan.